is in countdown. Falcon 9 is in startup. Dragon, SpaceX, go for launch. You are looking at a live view of Falcon 9 and Dragon awaiting liftoff from Space Launch Complex 40 or Slick 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. In just over 19 minutes, Falcon 9 will lift off carrying Dragon and the CRS-30 mission to the International Space Station. Good afternoon, I'm Yomei Zhou, a propulsion engineer here at SpaceX in Hawthorne, California. Dragon will deliver about 6,200 pounds of science, supplies, and equipment to the space station and will return with about 4,000 pounds in just about a month. Dragon will arrive at the space station and dock autonomously to the zenith port of the station's Harmony module on Saturday. For those of you following along, you'll know that this mission marks our 27th of the year and our 42nd Dragon mission to the station. It's also Dragon's third trip to the station this year, and it's only March. Today is the first time our upgraded Dragon spacecraft will be launching from Slick 40 after we stopped flying our previous version of Dragon back in 2020. To support our growing launch manifest, we've made new upgrades to Space Launch Complex 40, including a brand new tower and access arm, which enables more efficient late load operations as well as human spaceflight missions. The new crew arm allows Dragon flexibility to switch between pads LC-39A and Slick 40 for all missions. In addition to the crew access arm, the teams have recently added two emergency egress chutes to provide an additional way to rapidly evacuate the tower. Teams tested the new emergency chutes for the first time earlier this month. With these updates, we're on our way to having two launch pads capable of supporting flying humans to space. We'll have more exciting human spaceflight updates to share a little later in the program. Dragon is the only vehicle flying today that can fly a round trip to and from the, sp the space station, carrying vital supplies to space and returning safely with critical cargo. Today's Dragon spacecraft will be flying for the fourth time, and the Falcon 9 it's sitting on top of will be making its sixth flight. Reusability is key to everything we do here at SpaceX, and to date, we've, we've reflown 24 Dragon spacecraft and 241 Falcon 9 rockets. Speaking of Falcon 9, propellant loading began about 15 minutes ago and will complete at the T minus two minute mark. Weather is looking great with only a 10% probability of violation. Range is green and ready to support. Everything is looking good as we count down to an instantaneous launch attempt at 4.55 p.m. Eastern Time today. 
And with that, let's check in with Gary Jordan at NASA in Houston. Hey, Yome, it is great to be with you. I'm here at NASA's Mission Control Center in Houston, Texas, where flight controllers are looking after the orbital laboratory that is the ultimate destination after Dragon's launch today, the International Space Station. We're watching today's launch closely and working with the teams with you there in Hawthorne, California, as well as Falcon 9 teams at Kennedy's Space Center in Florida, following the launch criteria. As of this moment, the teams here in Mission Control Houston are go for launch. The International Space Station is ready to receive Dragon and the three tons of cargo on board. You'll see two flight directors in Houston today. There on screen is Flight Director Diane Daly and Nicole McElroy. Lots going on in this room and aboard the International Space Station today, and teams are following along in the action. Just this morning, the scheduled launch of the Soyuz MS-25 was automatically scrubbed by ground support equipment due to a low voltage reading in the Soyuz rocket electrical system at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. NASA astronaut Tracy Dyson with her counterparts, Soyuz Commander Oleg Novinsky and Space Flight Participant participant Marina Vasilevskaya have since safely egressed or exited the Soyuz spacecraft and left the launch pad and are safely back at the Cosmonaut Hotel crew quarters as teams evaluate another launch attempt. Meanwhile, here in Houston, teams shift focus to watch the countdown towards the launch of Dragon on top of Falcon 9 for NASA's SpaceX 30th Commercial Resupply Services mission. To dive a little deeper into the vehicles of this launch, I'll turn it back over to Yome in Hawthorne. Yome. As we continue to count down, let's take a closer look at the vehicles that will be taking CRS-30 to the space station today. Sitting atop the Falcon 9, the Dragon spacecraft and its trunk stand over 26 feet tall. The nose cone op opens shortly after launch to expose the four bulkhead thrusters and docking me mechanism that will connect with the station. Dragon is headed for the Zenith docking port on the station, which was just vacated by Crew-7, which came home last week. Dragon's trunk holds solar cells, which power Dragon while it's in free flight. The trunk can also carry unpressurized cargo, which it will be doing today. Dragon has 16 thrusters that can be used in space to help navigate the spacecraft to its destination, which each, with each thruster providing about 90 pounds of force. The Dragon spacecraft has played a significant role in advancing our future in space by safely transporting crew and cargo to and from the space station. There are currently four Dragon spacecraft supporting human spaceflight missions that have docked to the station, and their names are Endeavor, Resilience, Endurance, and Freedom. There are an additional three Dragon spacecraft supporting cargo missions. Altogether, the reusable Dragon spacecraft fleet has completed eight human spaceflight missions on behalf of NASA and has both visited the station and returned to Earth 41 times under NASA's commercial resupply and commercial crew programs. As always, Dragon will be delivered to orbit today by SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket, which provides 1.7 million pounds of thrust on its first stage thanks to its nine Merlin M1D engines. Today's booster last flew in January of this year for the Axiom 3 mission. Once the first and second stages separate, the Merlin engines are also used to help land the first stage back on Earth. The first stage today will be performing three burns as it makes its way back to Earth, First will be the boost back burn, where three of the M1D engines on the first stage will reignite to help flip that stage around to head back to the launch site. The second burn is the entry burn, where the same three engines will again reignite to help slow Falcon 9 down as it prepares to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. Finally, the landing burn, where the center engine of the Falcon 9 will slow down the rocket enough to perform a precision landing back down at landing zone one. Meanwhile, the second stage continues to orbit, powered by a single Merlin vacuum engine with over 220,000 pounds of thrust. The second stage will secure Dragon's entry into low Earth orbit before separating, leaving Dragon to continue its own journey to the space station on its own thrusters. About 50 seconds after separation, Dragon's nose cone deployment sequence will begin, exposing its guidance navigation controls that help Dragon autonomously fly to the space station. With T0 coming up in about 12 minutes, our teams at the Cape and Hangar X are doing a series of system checks to ensure Dragon and Falcon 9 are ready to fly. Reusability is key to making spacecraft, space flight more routine and ultimately what will enable humans to become multiplanetary. Down at Starbase, Texas, we are continuing to build, test, and fly Starship 
the world's most powerful launch vehicle ever developed. One week ago today, Starship returned to integrated flight testing with its third launch from Starbase. This flight achieved several milestones and firsts. Super Heavy completed its second full duration ascent burn, the, su the second successful hot stage separation, a successful flip mover maneuver, and this time made it through the boost back burn and attempted its first ever landing burn. Starship executed its first full duration ascent burn, making it to space and checking off several other test objectives, including opening and closing its payload door, AKA the PEZ dispenser, and initiating a propellant transfer demonstration and its first re-entry through the atmosphere. Starship brought never before seen live views of this atmospheric re-entry, utilizing the Starlink terminals installed on board to transmit a live high definition video signal, even as plasma built around it. Starship's rapid development approach has been the basis for all of SpaceX's major innovative advancements, including on Falcon, Dragon, and Starlink. Testing and learning is essential as we work to build a fully reusable transportation system capable of carrying both crew and cargo to Earth orbit to help humanity return to the moon and ultimately to travel to Mars and beyond. Building bases or even cities will require huge amounts of cargo and eventually crew, and that's where Starship comes in. In partnership with NASA, Starship will serve as the lander to put the first Artemis astronauts on the moon. The vehicle will perform one uncrewed demonstration flight before the Artemis III mission, which will be the first human surface expedition since 1972. With the ability to deliver cargo and people to the lunar surface, we'll be ready to help humanity build a sustainable presence on the moon and learn how to live off-world before the next step to Mars. Starship is now getting ready for its fourth test flight. Every launch and mission yields critical data for continuing to improve and pave the way for our future in space, and Flight 4 will continue that journey very soon. For now, I'll send it back over to Gary at JSC. Hey, thanks, Yome. Teams in Houston continue to watch the countdown of NASA's SpaceX CRS-30 mission, and everything's looking good. This will be the fourth launch to the International Space Station in an incredibly busy year. Take a look. 2024 has been a busy year for human spaceflight at NASA and traffic aboard the International Space Station, and there are no signs of slowing down. The year kicked off with the third private astronaut mission to the orbiting laboratory. Four crew members representing five nations remained in orbit for 18 days conducting science and outreach before returning to Earth. Multiple cargo deliveries have already made their way to station. Northrop Grumman's Cygnus cargo spacecraft launched on the SpaceX Falcon 9 for the first time with four tons of supplies. And the Progress spacecraft launched from Kazakhstan with another three tons of supplies a few weeks later. A cadre of four spacefarers once again launched from U.S. soil on NASA's SpaceX Crew-8 mission. Their arrival began a six-month expedition on station and relieved the Crew-7 quartet from their half-year stay aboard who undocked and splashed down off the coast of Florida shortly after Crew-8's arrival. And around the corner, we're gearing up for the first crewed flight of the Boeing Starliner on a mission to verify the spacecraft for transporting crew to and from the International Space Station and add this vehicle to the American fleet of human-rated spacecraft. While progress continues to be made in low Earth orbit, NASA continues to aim for the moon. The Artemis II crew has been preparing for their critical demonstration flight aboard Orion with training in Houston, Cape Canaveral, and off the coast of San Diego for recovery operations. Their mission, a giant leap to humanity's sustained presence on the lunar surface. And the astronaut corps of capable humans willing to take on these challenges in this busy time has only grown. In the midst of continued science and exploration in low Earth orbit, the latest class of NASA astronaut candidates recently graduated from their initial training and are now eligible for future assignments to the International Space Station and Artemis missions to the moon. These individuals will train alongside astronauts from many nations continuing scientific discovery, exploration, and inspiration together for humanity.
Continuing scientific discovery is enabled by missions like today. Dragon's about to bring up three tons of cargo, much of which includes scientific hardware and samples. The microgravity environment of the space station not only allows for a unique perspective from which to observe physical and biological phenomenon, but it serves as a test bed for improving technologies and capabilities that can send us farther into the solar system and advance our lives right here on Earth. The science portfolio inside Dragon right now includes Stage all of this one, enabled by scientists complete. and engineers who have been working for months, sometimes years, to prepare for this moment, a launch to the International Space Station. Here are some highlights of what's inside Dragon today. SpaceX is set to launch its 30th resupply services mission to the International Space Station, carrying science investigations to further NASA's missions to deep space and benefit life on Earth. A new set of sensors on Astro B robots will test technology to automate 3D sensing and mapping for future space missions. Researchers will observe photosynthesis in space to support the development of bioregenerative life support systems. A student-developed CubeSat will measure sea ice and wave height to enhance our understanding of climate change impacts. Researchers will test controlled nanoparticle arrangement using electric fields to help improve the efficiency of quantum dot synthesized solar cells. Discover more about all of the science making the journey to the orbiting lab at nasa.gov slash ISS dash science. Here at just about T minus five minutes, all systems are currently a go for an on-time liftoff. Strong back retraction will begin shortly and in preparation for that retraction. Strong back retract. You heard that call out, the sequence first beginning. In terminal count. Beginning strong back retraction has begun. You'll see the clamp arms on the second stage just below Dragon beginning to open. And then the strong back will recline away from Falcon 9. At that transporter erector, which is that large truss structure to the left of Falcon 9, is what will retract strong back is retracting. in preparation for liftoff. And you heard that call out that the strong back is retracting. You can see those clamp arms opening just below Dragon as well. In just a few seconds, you should see that strong back recline away from Falcon 9 and Dragon. There you can see the strong back slowly leaning away from Falcon 9 and Dragon. Over to you, Gary. That's right, after strong back retract, we're still counting down, about to approach three minutes, 30 seconds to launch. At this time, the fuel and oxidizer inside the first stage are f fully fueled. Fuel inside the second stage is al already at max capacity, and we're just topping off the liquid uh, oxygen on the second stage, which should wrap up topping about T minus two minutes. Now again, we're green, we're tracking good weather, 90% go, uh, beautiful skies there at the Kennedy Space Center and uh, sp uh, Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Now, for some reason, we do not launch today. There is a backup opportunity tomorrow, March 22nd, 4.29 p.m. Eastern. At T minus 60 seconds, Falcon 9 will be in startup. This means the rocket's autonomous internal flight computers will take over to the launch countdown. Complete. There you go. Locks load in stage one is complete. Counting down to T0 at about T minus two, the Merlin 1D engines will light for liftoff. The vehicle continues to be healthy and Falcon 9 team is tracking no issues. Currently the weather is green and the range is ready to support a T0 at 4.55 p.m. Eastern time. We have a 90% probability of launch today based on weather. And in these last few minutes, Falcon 9 is performing the final health checks on its primary communications, avionics, and propulsion systems in preparation for flight. We'll have that locks load call out complete here shortly. Stage two, locks load complete. 
With stage two, locks load complete. That gets us inside the two Track minute marker to idle. countdown. Checkouts on the second stage thrust vector control have passed. We'll get to uh, engine gibbling and wiggle test on the first stage much closer before ignition. At the time of launch, the International Space Station will be flying 260 statute Ground miles over the border out. of Mexico and Guatemala. Now, we are just about 20 seconds from T minus one minute where the Falcon 9 will be in startup and the onboard flight computers will take control of the countdown. Dragon will also transition to internal power at this time. Falcon 9 is in startup. We are now in startup. Dragon is in countdown. And Dragon is in countdown. Range remains go for launch, waiting for that final go from the SpaceX launch director. SpaceX launch director, go for launch. You heard that call out. The launch director has given that final go. All systems are go for launch of Falcon 9 in the CRS-30 mission. Fifteen seconds. Minus ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, ignition. And we're stopped at a dragon turn to the one complex 40. The time for science and cargo take flight on NASA's SpaceX 30th commercial resupply services mission. Falcon 9 at 1.7 million pounds of thrust. Pitching down range, hearing good calls of performance. Nominal trajectory as Falcon 9 and Dragon arc out to the northeast. Falcon 9 has successfully lifted off from Slick 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. And during ascent, we will tilt or gimbal our engines, guiding the rocket into what we call a gravity turn. Through this turn, the vehicle is flying both up and horizontally, nominal. horizontally away from the launch pad. Now, this rocket typically needs to go about 17,500 miles per hour horizontally in order to make it to orbit and avoid being pulled back down to Earth. So moments ago, we did throttle the engines down in preparation for max Q, or maximum aerodynamic pressure, in just a couple seconds. Max Q. There was that call out for max Q. And coming up, we have a few events in quick succession, starting with main engine cutoff, followed by stage separation, second engine startup one, and the start of the boost back burn for the first stage. And back is chilling. There's the call out. The MVAC engine on the second stage is chilling in, getting ready for startup. Now, the first of these events is ma main engine cutoff, or MECO, where the nine Merlin 1D engines on the first stage will shut down in preparation for stage separation, which is where stage one and two will separate from each other with the first stage making its way back down to Earth and the second stage uh, performing second engine start one which is where we ignite that single Merlin vacuum engine on board the second stage. Now the boost back burn will then start on the first stage. This burn helps assist the vehicle flip back around and reorient, reorient itself back to land. Mika is starting in just a couple seconds. Miko. Stage separation confirmed. Stage one boost back startup. There you heard and saw those events happening back to back. Awesome views of the first stage flipping back around as it performs its boost back burn. Again, we had main engine cutoff of the first stage, stage separation, second engine start on the second stage, and that first stage doing the awesome flip as it starts its boost back burn. Now this burn is a little under a minute, so we have about 20 seconds left in this burn. 
And about three minutes after that, we will have two additional burns on the first stage to prepare to land back at landing zone one at Cape Canaveral. We are at T plus three minutes and 30 seconds here in today's mission. CRS-30 is SpaceX's- Phase one boost back shutdown. There is that confirmation for the boost back shutdown of Both the first stage. nominal trajectory. And a nominal trajectory. As again, CRS-30 is SpaceX's 27th launch this year. And we are coming up on the entry burn of the first stage as well as second engine cutoff. On those live views of the first stage, you can see the attitude control system creating those beautiful puffs of white gas. And that's nitrogen from the cold gas thrusters of the attitude control system. And around T plus six minutes and 30 seconds, you should see on your screen the first stage's entry burn. And for the entry burn, we relight three of the M1D engines on the first stage, starting with the center engine nine, followed shortly by engines one and five, which slows the vehicle down as it passes back into the Earth's atmosphere. We need to slow down to reduce re-entry forces, which helps us to recover and reuse the first stage. In the second stage on the right, you can see beautiful views of the Earth in the background and that Merlin vacuum engine heating up as it performs its burn. Again, we are a little over a minute to the start of our first stage entry burn. You can see the first stage on those live views on your left with two of the four hypersonic grid fins deployed, helping steer that first stage down as it makes its way back home to Earth. Now you can see the telemetry on the bottom left and right hands of your screen. The right-hand side is the second stage carrying our Dragon capsule, and the left-hand side is the first stage. You can see the second stage speeding up as it is performing its burn, and the first stage is coming back down towards the Earth's atmosphere with the altitude decreasing. Really cool views from the attitude control system of the first stage. Just about 20 seconds from the start of our first stage entry burn. We should be able to see really cool views of that burn from those views on the left of your screen. Stage one entry burn startup. There is the start of the stage one entry burn. And this is a three engine burn on the first stage of Falcon 9. Stage one entry burn shut down. There you stage saw. Stage one FTS has saved. Really cool views of the end of the first stage entry burn and Both the flight. Stages, nominal trajectory. And the call outs for nominal trajectory and the flight termination system being saved. Now the first stage that is supporting today's mission will be has just performed this entry burn for the sixth time. Falcon 9 is the world's first orbital class reusable rocket and this allows SpaceX to refly the most expensive parts of the rocket which in turn drives stage down one transonic drives down the cost of access to space. Now coming up we have that landing burn starting in just a few moments. There is the start of stage one landing burn. Start of that landing burn. Really cool view of Cape Canaveral coast. Stage one landing leg deploy. Wow, wonderful views of that first stage landing. Stage one landing confirmed. Back at landing zone one. Looking pristine there, and there you have it. Guidance. 
That landing marks SpaceX's 286 recovery of an orbital class rocket, including the first stage landings for Falcon stage 9 two, FTS has saved. and Heavy. You heard that call out that stage two FTS is safe, getting ready for second engine cutoff here in just under 10 seconds. And back, shut down. There is that second engine cutoff with the MVAC shutdown call out, waiting for confirmation of a good orbital Nominal insertion. Orbit insertion. There is that confirmation of good orbit. It looks like we are on track for Dragon separation in just a few minutes, just before the T plus 12 minute mark. It has been a great launch so far. As I mentioned earlier, today's launch was the first for our upgraded Dragon to be flying from Slick 40 after we stopped flying the older dra older version of Dragon back in 2020. I just wore our growing launch manifest. We've made new upgrades to Space Launch Complex 40, including a brand new tower and access arm, which enables more efficient late load operations as well as human spaceflight missions. Now with these updates, we are on our way to having two launch pads capable of supporting flying humans to space. You can see really cool views of the MVAC engine and the Earth in the background from the second stage. And in addition to flying cargo to support crew on board the space station, SpaceX also enables researchers the opportunity to fly critical science to orbit on Dragon, which has carried over 1,000 research experiments to and from low Earth orbit and the International Space Station since 2012. Enabling research in space paves the way for us to explore beyond Earth and make life multiplanetary. And now we are waiting for Dragon to separate from Falcon 9's second stage. To recap so far, we had an on-time liftoff at 4.55 p.m. Eastern Time. Everything has proceeded nominally so far. Stage separation occurred at about two and a half minutes into flight, and that was followed by a successful landing of Falcon 9's first stage at landing zone one back in Cape Canaveral, Florida. That was the sixth landing for that particular Falcon 9 first stage. And for those of you following along, this Dragon capsule has also supported CRS-22, CRS-24, and CRS-27, which were three additional cargo resupply missions to the International Space Station. At about T plus eight and a half minutes, we had a successful second engine cutoff, followed by confirmation of a good orbital insertion. The vehicle is now coasting with Dragon attached, and we are just about 30 seconds away from spacecraft separation. We're seeing great views from the second stage with the Earth and the sun in the background as it prepares to separate Dragon so that Dragon can begin its journey to the International Space Station. Just a few seconds from payload deployment. You can see Dragon floating away there. It's very exciting to see Dragon is drifting away from Falcon 9 second stage there, confirming good spacecraft separation. Now SpaceX is honored to be a part of NASA's Commercial Resupply Services Initiative to deliver critical cargo to the space station. And we thank NASA for entrusting us with today's mission. For those of you following along, you'll know that this mission marks our 27th of the year. Congratulations to the SpaceX team. We're just in March and we're already launched in partnership with NASA missions like Axiom 3, Cygnus, and PACE, Intuitive Machines, Crew A, and more. You can check SpaceX.com slash launches for up-to-date missions and schedules. But that will do it for me here in Hawthorne. But I'm handing it over to Gary to take us through nose co Dragon nose cone opening. Gary? Hey, thank you, Yome. We were following along from here in Mission Control Houston, a wonderful launch. 
of Dragon from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Great to see Dragon in orbit and starting its journey on the way to the International Space Station. We're continuing our coverage here in Mission Control Houston, awaiting for the nose cone to deploy. The nose cone is at the very tip of the Dragon spacecraft. Once deployed, exposes the four forward bulkhead Dracos. These Draco thrusters will execute the series of maneuvers necessary to raise its orbit and meet up with the destination of Dragon's launch today, the International Space Station. Of course, after separation, it is carrying three tons of supplies, including science, as well as some food to the International Space Station. A common question we get is what sorts of treats and food are inside Dragon that the Expedition 70 crew aboard station is awaiting. We did receive word that there is a fresh food kit, including some fruits and vegetables like citrus, apples, and cherry tomatoes inside Dragon right now. There's also two crew requested coffee kits and 60, that's six zero, bulk overwrap bags. These are standard bobs containing some standard um, food menu items as well as some crew preference choices. You're getting a live look at the second stage, now transferring to the control rooms. On the left side, you see the SpaceX mission control teams over in Hawthorne, California, that oversaw today's launch and will continue to monitor Dragon on its journey to the International Space Station over the next day and a half. The teams you see there on the right are here with me in Mission Control Houston, the International Space Station flight control teams monitoring the orbiting complex and, of course, the operations jointly with Hawthorne, uh, the flight controllers there. Joint operations between the two teams you see here will come a little bit closer to when Dragon is in its final approach phase, uh, just about two hours or so prior to docking. Docking is scheduled for early Saturday morning. Teams here are waiting for the nose cone deploy um, of Dragon, and we're standing by and continuing our coverage. Now, a little bit about the uh, coming days and what Dragon and the journey that Dragon will undergo. So now that we are past the spacecraft separation, separation from the Falcon 9 and awaiting that nose cone deploy, we're in the activation and rendezvous phase of the mission. During this phase, phase Dragon is configured for on-orbit operations. The phase begins after separation that we just saw from the Falcon 9 and ends with the completion of the final co-elliptic burn. The initial orbit today is about 190 kilometers by 210 kilometers, those values representing the perigee and apogee of the orbit, or the lowest and highest points over the Earth. Not a perfect circle, more like a very slight ellipse. So over the next day and a half, Dragon will execute a series of burns, which will gradually raise its orbit to align more closely with the station. There are five major burns uh, where the Draco thrusters on Dragon will fire and bring the spacecraft close to the station before we begin the final approach maneuvers. Let's go ahead and review that now. First is the first major burn, the phase burn. This is performed at the first apogee or the highest point of the initial orbit and raises Dragon's perigee or the lowest point to a higher altitude. The next burn, which based on the orbital data that show, that we're seeing, is the boost burn, which raises Dragon's orbit until it reaches an altitude just about 10 kilometers lower than the space station. This is followed soon after by the close co-elliptic burn to place Dragon on an orbit that's roughly co-elliptic with the space station. It means the crew, or the Dragon itself, will be about 10 kilometers lower than the station during the entire orbit around the Earth. The fourth maneuver is the transfer burn, where we're raising Dragon's apogee, or the highest point of its orbit, to just two and a half kilometers below the station. Then we round everything out with what's called a final co-elliptic burn, to once again maintain that orbit just beneath the station, but this time on a plane that is two and a half kilometers below. We did get word that the nose cone is starting to deploy. This sequence takes just a couple of minutes until it's fully open, and again, exposing the forward bulkhead Dracos that will execute the maneuvers you see here on your screen. The final co-elliptic burn you see there on the screen will lead us to the approach initiation. This is the final stages of Dragon's rendezvous with the space station and beginning integrated operations with the team here in Mission Control Houston and the teams over in Hawthorne, California. 
during the approach, the SpaceX flight controllers were working tandem with the teams here to execute, uh, to test out a number of systems and test communications between the spacecraft and the station with a system called C2V2, which stands for Common Communication for Visiting Vehicles. Sets up a data stream between the Dragon and the station. We'll see that maneuver on Saturday, early morning, bringing uh, the approach initiation burn and bringing Dragon just below the International Space Station. Teams you see here on your screen are monitoring the Dragon after its separation. To begin the activation and rendezvous phase, we are opening the nose cone. We're about halfway through and tracking good progress. Once it is fully opened, they'll perform a series of checks to work on those forward bulkhead Draco engines. These are on the very tip of the Dragon spacecraft and will execute those burn maneuvers that we just went over. Twenty minutes after the launch of NASA's SpaceX 30th Commercial Resupply Services mission. Still continuing to follow along, the teams here are monitoring the opening of the nose cone at the end of the Dragon spacecraft. Again, exposing those forward bulkhead Dracos. We'll continue to cover this mission until that is fully open. So again, the nose cone is fully deployed and the teams are checking those forward bulkhead dra Dracos. Uh, that'll begin the sequence in that activation and rendezvous phase to begin the series of five major burns to raise Dragon's orbit and get closer to the International Space Station. So now that the nose cone is deployed, Dragon is ready for those phasing burns, as I mentioned, to the International Space Station. With a successful, or successful orbital insertion, I'm now joined on the phone by Christy Duplishin. Deputy Manager of the International Space Station Dep Transportation Integration Office. Christy, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, it's good to be here. Hey, Christy, you had the pleasure of being at the Kennedy Space Center for launch. What was going through your mind as you witnessed yet another cargo mission successfully launch into orbit? Oh my, yes, even though it's the 30th cargo mission for SpaceX, it never gets old. Um, I do still get nervous before each mission, and I think um, back to something one of my mentors said when I worked flight control back in the shuttle days. He said, 
if you're not nervous before a launch, then you aren't remembering what it means to do this. And so I think that sums up how I felt. Um, and before each mission, regardless of how many times it happens, and I was adequately nervous. And so um, I'm also thinking about all the work that goes into making a launch happen. There's so many dedicated and hardworking people uh, that work every day to make these flights happen. And I'm so happy to be a part of it. So you can't just help but smile. It's so true, Christy, and really the team is putting a lot of work in, not just for this launch, but many others. The space station right now is a high traffic area. We've seen a lot of traffic before this launch, and we'll continue to see more. What are some of the challenges for your office during a busy season of traffic aboard the International Space Station? That's absolutely true. It has been very busy over the last few months. Um, we still have several flights ahead of us. Uh, our team is great at keeping up with all of these vehicles that are coming and going. Um, as we prepare for these missions, our team makes sure that the vehicles and teams are ready to fly. One of the things I enjoy most about this job is the opportunity to work with the different commercial providers that are in different stages of development. Um, I'd say that one of our challenges is to make sure that we continue to evolve to meet our commercial provider needs uh, as we continue in our goal of commercializing low Earth orbit. Uh, we're here to support them and, and help them be successful. So um, it's a challenge and a privilege um, as we continue on these goals. It's important, right? There's a lot happening and there's uh, we're seeing more traffic and more launches than ever before. Now, when mm -hmm. considering the traffic, science is key. And Dragon has the important science objective to deliver uh, science and also to station and also return that science back to Earth. How does the criticality of science fold into your office's planning? Yeah, that's a good question. Science is key. Um, my office has the responsibility of providing the service to get all of the science and all the cargo, um, even the hardware that we need for uh, different activities on orbit, um, we get it all there to station. And so we work closely with the research and integration office to understand the needs of those uh, research experiments and that each provider has for each of those missions. Um, so for example, that's whether there, um, there are any time constraints that the science has when we load it on the vehicle for launch or if the experiment needs any special accommodations while it's in Dragon. And we work with um, our science team to make sure we understand that and then communicate that to our vehicle provider. Um, then we look across missions to make sure that we have a flight lined up uh, to be able to re be ready to fly um, the science when it's ready to go. Um, and then also we have to return some of the science. So we also make sure that we have a flight ready to bring that science home when it's ready. So we work very closely with them uh, because we are providing that, uh, providing the ride. A lot of work and it's absolutely critical. Christy Duplishin, NASA Deputy Manager of the International Space Station Transportation Integration Office, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, thanks for having me. So Dragon will begin the methodical approach to the station with phasing burns to again close the distance between the cargo spacecraft and the orbiting laboratory. This will take approximately a day and a half with approach and docking to the International Space Station expected early in the morning on Saturday, March 23rd. Join us on NASA TV and NASA Plus for our coverage of the final approach and docking of this spacecraft beginning at 4.30 a.m. Central Time, 5.30 a.m. Eastern on Saturday for a docking expected near 6.30 a.m. Central, 7.30 a.m. Eastern. Visit NASA.gov for the latest updates on our coverage and expected docking time as we follow the operations through the next few days. Thank you for following our joint coverage of NASA's SpaceX 30th Commercial Resupply Services launch. That'll wrap it up for here in for us here in Houston as well as our colleagues in Hawthorne. Until next time, this is Mission Control Houston.